Good afternoon and welcome to this, the fifth in our 2021 webinar series delivered by Dr. Tim Sandal. These monthly webinars are covering different aspects of Annex 1. Hopefully they will help you prepare when that goes live later this year. Today's topic will cover people in clean rooms, contamination risks, clothing and behaviour. Before we start, I'd just like to go through a couple of housekeeping points. If you have any technical issues, please send a short message in the questions box on the right hand side of your screen. Um, we will endeavour to try and answer your questions as soon as possible, um, but please be aware that um, we are working remotely, so there might be a little bit of a delay. At the end of, um, sorry, during the webinar today, I'd also like you to ask questions using the same questions box. And at the end of the webinar, time permitting, we'll try to answer as many of these as possible. Any we don't get round to, we will answer offline and share them with you along with a copy of the slides from today's webinar. Thank you for tuning in. If you're tuning in for the first time, my name's Annette Russell and I'm the sterile manufacturing lead here at RSSL. I work in the commercial team and I work directly with our pharmaceutical microbiology group. This group support our clients who are involved in both sterile and non-sterile manufacture. For those that have attended our previous webinars, welcome back. Um, if you're interested, we ha will have further webinars from September, we're taking a break in August, so please do sign up or you can download any webinars from last year or earlier this year. If you are interested in any of the services that I'm going to speak about, please contact me using the contact details on your screen now. So this uh, session, I've been getting you to meet our pharmaceutical microbiology team. And today I would like you to meet Beth Thomas. Beth has worked in our pharma micro team at RSSL for almost three years, working in a variety of areas within the lab, including being trained in our new sterility testing facility. And more recently, she's been involved in scheduling and performing both the endotoxin testing and our microbial limit tests. Hi, Beth. Hiya. Hi. So Beth, could you give us a brief overview of what your role is in the team at RSSL? Yeah, of course. So I work mostly in the clean lab where, like you say, I'm responsible for scheduling and organizing the workflow. I also perform endotoxins and microbial limits testing. Um, but as you say, I'm also trained in sterility. So as and when needed, I also help them out with testing. Um, and day to day changes um, a little bit depending on needs of the business at the time. So it's a bit flexible. OK, so I guess then it, it's quite hard for you to say what a normal week would look like for you. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 a week is a bit more easy to predict, whereas day to day it's a bit more changeable. <laughs> um, but yeah, weekly I do mostly testing. Um, I start out scheduling. Um, sometimes I have quality actions or quality records to fill in. Um, I always work on lab improvements and also writing things like controlled documents. OK, so we all know that there have been many changes in microbiology over the years. And one of the key changes is in the endotoxin testing area. Um, at RSSL, we currently have turbometric and chromogenic techniques. How do these compare with the old gel clot methods? So the old gel clot methods was the simplest LAL test done. And it's read manually, so it's qualitative. So it was just a tube that you kind of tipped on its side and saw how turbid it was. Um, so this is a bit more um, subjective reading and it's potentially more susceptible to interference from other factors as well. Um, but turbidometric and chromogenic give you a value, so they're quantitative, um, which makes them a lot more accurate. Um, they also give you additional readings like um, uh, PPC and CV, they're called. Um, they help with things like validity of your results and stuff. Yeah. Okay. 
So I, I understand that you and the team have been um, working with our endotoxin suppliers and have investigated the, the new recombinant endotoxin kit that does away with using the horseshoe crab. How does that yeah. compare? With the, um, the so methods we currently use, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so this is, no, no, not at all. So this is a really interesting and new clever technique. Um, it uses the same cascade of reactions as the kinetic assays that we do, the tibidometric and the chromogenic, but it has, as you say, no animal content, um, which is really cool for sustainability and things like that. Um, so the because it's not a biologically made reagent. It's um, good for products where glucan interference could be expected because it's specific to just endotoxins. Um, yeah, and we had a great opportunity to be the first to use the um, technology in the UK for ACC. So that was really cool. So this this new method's not a pharmacopoeia method yet, um, but as you say, it does show sustainability, which is what the industry is moving towards. Um, when do you think we'll be able to offer this at RSSL? Um, so we expect the technique will be recognised by Pharmacopeia in the future, but until then we are ready to support with carrying out validation work um, that other clients might require to, you know, add on to the fact that it's not a Pharmacopeia method. Um, and at the moment we're waiting on our first inquiry, but we're really excited at the prospect of adding it to our offerings in the future. Okay, excellent. And finally, um, what do you choose to do for your downtime when you're you're not involved in testing endotoxins and, and microbial limits for our clients? Uh, so outside of work, I love spending time with my friends and my family. I really like to cook and bake and I'm a really avid gym goer as well. Oh, well done. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks, Beth. Thanks for your time. All right, thank you very much. So as the sterile manufacturing commercial um, team leader, I work with Reg and his team that Beth's in. Um, but at RSSL, we can offer so much more to help support you to implement and adhere to the Annex 1 regulations. This slide here shows you some of the areas we can help with. So we can help with things like your environmental monitoring, where we can um, perform risk assessments for new builds, for example, through to um, performing any routine testing that you may want doing, including any identification of contaminants using our Multitoff system. Um, we can also perform validation of your disinfectants, uh, which is a key requirement of Annex 1. And as um, Beth mentioned, she uh, it works with our sterility team. We have the new sterility suite up and running, and this can um, provide an assurance to people looking for um, sterility help. RSSL has extensive experience um, in helping raw material testing for the pharmaceutical industry with many well-equipped labs. Um, as well as pharmacopoeia tests, we can also help support the biopharma industry with some of those more specialized methods. And of course, as well as sterility, we offer the suite of microbial analysis from water testing through to, as we've heard, endotoxin and bioburdens for those raw materials. Um, as, as the sterile industry has grown, you can, there's been a, a, an increased demand for vial and stopper testing, and our, we have a team of experts that are able to perform that for you. Um, if you got a chance to see our Rizwan interview, um, it'll be on you, our YouTube channel um, where they talk about how they go about doing that. In terms of plastics and the um, single-use plastics that are used in the manufacture, Annex 1 suggests that you need to know the ENL profile of these. And again, RSSL have a dedicated ENL team to support such activities. Um, finally, we have a microscopy department that can help with any of those um, particulates that you may find during your production runs or can perform some sub -vis testing in line with the pharmacopoeia. And we have a, a training team that can help train all your staff, um, be online or virtual courses, through to bespoke in-house courses when um, allowed. And we have a range of consultants that we can call upon to help assist with things like setting up a cleaning validation of your facility. 
In fact, I'd like to point out that Tim is running one of our training courses on the 12th of October on developing a pharmaceutical contamination control strategy. So if you're interested, please feel free to contact me. So that's enough of me. And I'd like to now introduce you to our guest speaker, Dr. Tim Sandel. I'm sure many of you have heard of Tim and subscribed to his many publications. So Tim has over 25 years of experience of microbiological research and biopharmaceutical processing. He is the member of several editorial boards and has written over 600 book review, book chapters, peer review papers and technical articles relating to microbiology. Tim works for a pharmaceutical manufacturer in the UK and also find time to be a visiting tutor both at the University of Manchester and UCL. Over to you, Tim. Okay, thank you very much. Share my screen. Okay, good to go. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, so um, this uh, webinar is looking at the um, fundamental risks relating to um, people and their operations within the clean room environment. So for the next 35 to 40 minutes, I shall uh, present on the subject. And then as Annette said, we can take some um, questions at the end of the webinar. Um, so this presentation will do a very kind of brief introduction to clean rooms and then proceed to look at contamination control risks. We'll have a look at um, what particular challenges um, are presented by people with reference to the um, human microbiome and the uh, ecology of um, human skin. And then we look at steps to protect clean rooms from people, some of the environmental monitoring um, that's specific to people. So certainly within aseptic areas, that would be the um, finger dabs and gowns. Um, have a look at what appropriate alert and action levels would be, particularly for gowns, because that's not something which um, always receives um, sufficient attention. And then uh, finish up with the importance of characterising uh, microorganisms. Okay, so just to begin with um, clean rooms, just to put everything into, into context, and uh, for those less familiar with clean rooms, just to bring um, everyone up to speed. Um, so the pharmaceutical manufacturing environment is based around a series of rooms with um, specially controlled environments and we refer to these as clean rooms and um, the objective is that cleanliness is controlled and Tim, the sorry to, 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 to butt in your, fade, your microphone's faded out a little bit oh. I don't know if there's any adjustment you can make Sorry, is, is that any better now? That's a lot better, thank you. Okay. Thanks for sorry, bearing with I've us. Had, <laughs> yeah, I've had computer troubles um, today. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so we have these rooms which are called uh, clean rooms. And the assessment of cleanliness is based on the particle concentration in the air. And uh, there are obviously other factors as well to do with microbial contamination, the risks presented by people. And we did have a look at that at the previous um, webinar. And the key to control of the particle cleanliness is by filtering the air, as we looked at last time, via HEPA filters. And we're seeking uh, H13 or H14 class against the EN8, uh, 1822 standard ensuring that the room air is replaced with a sufficient volume of clean air, ensuring that air moves in the desired direction, and with having uh, cleaner areas at a higher pressure to less clean areas. So these were some of the fundamental principles that we looked at um, last time. And with um, the contamination vectors that um, 
we, we face when we're considering um, microbial um, contamination. Um, we have air itself. So this could be uh, ingress from faulty HEPA filters or what's deposited into the air stream. And it always remains that um, contamination in the air remains a bigger risk um, when contamination is deposited onto a surface rather than remaining suspended into the air. So understanding the way that the air behaves in the clean room is again of something important. And as we come to look at people, um, we need to be sure that the clean room can cope with the numbers of people and their particular activities um, within that particular space. Um, with surfaces, you know, we have to recognise that um, most surfaces, unless they've been recently disinfected, may potentially have a level of contamination on them. Uh, this contamination becomes a risk when there is an act of transfer from a less critical location to a more critical location. So that could be from um, uh, utensils left in the wrong place or somebody touching a, a surface. So the control of gloved hands is something else that will feed into the people aspect in a minute. And then water, as we've also discussed before, is a dual problem because water is an effective vector of contamination, be that from leaking pipes or poorly maintained water tubing through the generation of aerosols or water ending up in the wrong place, on the floor or behind a piece of wet equipment. And for the uh, a number of gram negative organisms, water provides the opportunity for those organisms to survive and then potentially to reproduce. But the most important risk, the, the key factor is presented from people. Um, so we present a contamination risk to any indoor environment. And that includes clean rooms, um, depending upon the level of control we can actually achieve. And this is through the um, release of skin detritus and oils. Um, we know that a number of cosmetics produce um, very high levels of particulates. Um, when we uh, talk, we can release uh, water droplets. Um, it's less elegantly might be referred to as spittle. Um, then there are uh, clothing uh, debris as well. So this can be in form of lint or fibers and so on. Um, hair, uh, the way we touch things and then the actual movement that we undertake. And we've also seen that um, the uh, faster we move, then the more contamination we're likely to shed and what we can touch on that as well. Um, so if people carry this much contamination and as clean rooms are, are ideally designed as good functional clean air spaces, it stands that clean rooms will work well until people enter them. And the number of um, skin cells of, of different particulate matter that is shed per day extends into the um, millions it only takes about 10 days to completely replace the uh, outer layer of the skin with with new skin cells we know from the work of people like bill white in the uh, university of glasgow that around 20 percent of shed skin particulates will be carrying microorganisms either bacteria or fungi on them and this is where the term microbial carrying particles comes from, because very few um, microorganisms are free floating in clean rooms. The vast majority are attached to rafts of other matter and overwhelmingly that, that is skin um, particles. So the main issues that we would be concerned about for people working in clean rooms is what might be classed as improper behaviors. So this could be matters relating to gowning. So the actual um, way that somebody gowns, either through their particular technique or too many other people being gowned around the same time who themselves may have poor technique. 
the quality of the gown. So um, gown control policy is really important, be that uh, ready to use disposable, kind of like Tyvek type gowns or um, relaundered gowns. And then also how long the gown is um, itself worn for. There's going to be a limit, particularly through uh, people perspiring and that affecting the uh, filtration efficiency of the gown. And then there's also the spread of contamination through sneezing. And there's a delightful slow motion photograph on the slide there of, of, of a sneeze and uh, gives an idea of the sort of distances that um, sneezing can go over and through coughing. And then, as I mentioned before, um, through um, touching. So with touching, you have this idea of this contamination uh, by transfer factor. Um, so with people, it's always a good idea to um, try and minimise any interaction that people have with product, whether that's a, a non-sterile product or a the manufacturing of a sterile product or then the aseptic filling of a of a product. So we always want to minimise the number of times that hands and arms are transferred into a cleaner area or directly over open product. So whether it's a case of scripting that or um, developing good work practices, but that needs to be cut down as much as possible, because although we can practice good techniques, the fewer the times that we need to engage with those techniques, then, then the fewer the opportunities for contamination that are going to arise. Um, and with the dispersion of contaminants um, from a surface to the air within a clean room, then a lot of this is also dependent upon how people act. We can also factor in faulty machinery as well. So if we have, um, when we start something up and it, and it shudders, then that can also be something of concern. So we do need to consider glove and gown um, quality, uh, and particularly um, at what frequency we're going to require uh, glove sanitization, and at what frequency we're going to ask for gloves to be um, changed. A kind of mitigation factor um, is though is the kind of steps involved with transfer and directly touching something. So the picture on the slide is an example that put together of um, of poor practice. So here we have an operator touching a vial. So the operator's hands are contaminated. That could transfer um, to the vial and inside the vial. So an interim step there would be to hold the vial with four sets. Could just slightly minimise in that that transfer um, step. Now to loop back something I mentioned um, before, that even wearing a uh, clean room suits, people um, will generate particles. And the generation of particles is a measure of the particular activity. And this is something that's been known for quite a long time. So you'll see the reference on the slide there to where I took this data from. And it's a, it's a paper from the earlier uh, days of, of clean rooms for um, healthcare applications. I think you know, the first kind of clean rooms then came in about 1961. So this is a 1965 um, paper. And uh, this has been verified through um, air dispersal chambers uh, multiple times um, since then. But you can see that walking produces more particles than sitting and uh, running or brisk walking produces more particles than uh, a sort of a slower steady movement. And this is wearing clean room uh, garments. So understanding the movement pattern of the operator inside the clean room is of great importance. And this is why, particularly when we're talking about uh, gray B areas, for example, there's a big emphasis put on uh, slow, deliberate movements and not moving uh, unless you actually needed to. So if you're waiting for something to happen, it's standing still until um, there's, a, there's a need to engage in a particular activity. And it's not only a factor of particle generation, but the other factor of um, walking quickly is the degree of turbulence that, that is generated. And um, there are things like uh, computational fluid dynamics that can show um, how turbulence varies as well. So this is the air not conforming to its 
normal pattern but being disrupted and the closer that person is to something of importance then the greater the level of disruption that, that ensures so it's something else to um, consider um, and then with the um, the coughing and the sneezing that we we discussed um, so this is research that was undertaken in uh, Sweden and this is um, without wearing a mask and here we can see um, the high numbers of particles that are um, produced and the relationship between uh, being uh, either non-viable organisms or um, other matter compared to uh, viable organisms and some of this is quite interesting in relation obviously to the um, COVID-19 situation as well and the talking loudly is interesting because um, you know, obviously one of the factors is um, that there's obviously a greater chance of um, spreading coronavirus from an infected person by talking quietly by talking loudly and then by um, singing on the football terrace to throw in a contemporary reference but um this is a, a good example of why uh, face mask protection is is quite important and then um, with cosmetics and one of the reasons why um, many facilities um, have a all cosmetics should be removed and this is embedded in um, annex one in both current annex one and with revised annex one it's just the sheer number of particles that um, cosmetics um, produce and again uh, this is based on a study from about 20 years ago um, but you can see the um, vast numbers of um, particles that are, are generated with um, eyeshadow and mascara um, coming out top as the as, as fundamental problems in relation to um, particular um, generation so for these reasons um, this is why there's this strong emphasis upon protecting products from people and the absolute necessity of this in relation to aseptically filled um, products so in relation to um, aseptic products then we also have these two principles we're wrapping people in clean room clothing and in aseptic areas there will be um, no exposed skin and, and the revision to annex one is emphasizing again the the absolute necessity of goggles rather than safety glasses so there's that whole complete um, protection and this is the minimized amount of shedding of um, microorganisms and it's useful to um, think of clean room suits as uh, walking filter filtration systems um, and then we put localized protection around the product uh, barrier systems to minimize Sorry, I was muted there for a second. Um, then we put um, localized protection around um, product in the form of barrier systems like ramps and um, isolators. And this capsule is really important that it's not broken. And any time there's an intervention, that always becomes a very high risk um, activity. And for these, for the acts of interventions and the acts of gowning and the acts of movement, it's really important that these are embedded in good training systems and they are practiced at regular um, intervals. It's also really important that um, attention is paid to personal hygiene and all staff working in clean rooms you know, have responsibility for their own um, personal hygiene. So this includes things like um, daily showers, the changing of underwear and the importance of washing hands before entering into the um, clean room um, facility. However, certain individuals might be um, higher shedders than others and in some rare cases that's um, a natural factor that is very difficult to control and it might be that um, that person isn't really suited to working in a clean room. With other people, it might be a, a factor of variation. So it could be the um, time that a shower is taken. For, for some people, um, showering before going to work might be better. For others, it might be 
um, after going to work. And also care needs to be taken to the types of um, soaps and shower gels and so on that, that are used. Um, certain ones can uh, could be very effective at cleaning the skin, but they can also reduce the presence of natural skin lubricants, and this can make the skin drier and therefore more susceptible to particle um, generation. So again, if, if someone is seen to be uh, a slightly higher shedder, has a slightly higher association of particles or even microorganisms, then there are some practices that can be varied, which can be quite um, useful. And then there's an array of different types of garments, and there are different quality um, garments out there. Uh, a lot of the uh, major name um, garment suppliers will provide good quality garments, but um, it's always in, uh, useful to make sure that the garment that's being obtained is of appropriate um, quality. And um, the photo on the slide um, is, is a close up of a typical gown. You can see there it's a series of sort of meshed um, fibers. And the way that a gown keeps particles uh, generated from the body within, but uh, allows air, air to pass is known as the filtration efficiency of the gown. And there's always gonna be a balance because um, the higher the filtration efficiency, then the more particles that are retained. However, the greater that is, then the level of operator discomfort increases because that's due to the buildup of heat and the uh, a slight reduction in air filtration. So there's always gonna be a degree of balance that needs to be um, struck. Um, with um, face masks, then this is obviously a very important um, aspect to reduce the risk of a person um, breathing uh, contamination in relation to the um, product. Um, and we want masks that are not going to disperse fibers into the environment. We don't want a mask to uh, release, even though these are non-microbial, there's still an impurity that could end up in the, in the product. And we want to make sure that the mask is providing adequate filtration. So it is trapping contamination, but allowing the operator to breathe. And we want masks that are easy to fit on and have a relative level of um, comfort. And the mask should also be able to withstand sterilization, which is the requirement of working in aseptic areas. And it's important for when we come to look at um, exit um, suit monitoring um, that attention is paid to sampling of the mask um, post use for coming out of aseptic areas. This could either be a regular sample or a sample that's periodically assessed. Um, and where also we, before we've touched upon um, culture media qualification, um, it's important to know that the culture media, I, I guess in most cases that's going to be TSA, is able to recover uh, streptococci because it's going to be uh, streptococci that are the key risk in association with the inside of the nose and the mouth and, and potentially staphylococcus. On, on the outside, but some brands of TSA are not very good at growing streptococci. So um, it's important to understand whether the media that's being used can detect that particular uh, group of organisms. And along with masks and gowns, gloves are also fundamental to reducing contamination transfer. So gloves should provide adequate protection and that might require an assessment of any chemicals that the glove might come into contact with because we don't want the glove to degrade and there may be a health and safety factor for the people who are wearing it. It's important that gloves are powder free because there's again the risk of another impurity interacting with the um, product. And also because of the uh, regularity uh, the, of glove sanitization, then the glove should not adversely react with 70% uh, IPA. We also want to make sure that the glove has a strong degree of physical strength so that all actions within the clean room are possible without the risk of the glove um, tearing. 
and within the aseptic area, the glove should be sterile. And it's generally a good practice that double gloving is, is the entry route within, into the um, clean room. So with all this type of protection, with, with gloves, masks, um, gowns, controlled behaviours, which is all really good, but um, anyone whose job is involved in looking at environmental monitoring will know that um, microbial problems still occur at, at different frequencies. Um, and the risks exist because of the sheer numbers of um, organisms in, and, and skin cells that are being shed. And it's physically impossible for garments that are designed for people to breathe and feel comfortable can retain all human detritus. And it's clear from um, reviews of clean room organisms that skin related microorganisms remain the biggest um, risk within um, clean rooms. Um, so I have got a, um, a review that I did into clean room uh, microorganisms. So um, I'm happy to send that out or send that copy to Annette uh, and that can be emailed on to anyone who's, who's interested um, with that. Um, so we know from the human uh, skin microbiome that there are um, differences in uh, species and there are um, differences in uh, populations. And a lot of this has been drawn from the uh, Human Microbiome Project research that's been going on now for about, about 15 years, where uh, metagenomics has um, opened up uh, the sheer variety of microorganisms found on the across the human skin. So the density of population varies from the hundreds to the thousands per square centimeter, and you tend to get the highest um, numbers of microorganisms in relation to um, um, sweat glands, so uh, groins and folds between the, the toes and under the armpits tend to give relatively high densities. Um, there's also fairly high densities found close to um, the nose, mouth and eyes. And uh, generally where those parts of the skin that have slightly higher moisture um, content as well. Um, and also areas that are slightly more uh, occluded compared to um, dry areas. So um, the, in, the interesting part of this is that uh, not all areas of the skin pose the same levels of microbial um, challenges. It's also notable that the microbiome um, alters over time and its stability varies considerably. And the kind of research that's been going on has shown that um, species of, of, of skin fungi tend to change more often than bacteria. And there's variation uh, in different body locations. So for example, um, if we're worried about anaerobic bacteria, um, then the forehead and association with those, four, uh, with those hair follicles is one of the primary um, risk areas. Um, whereas the gram positive cocci are much more with hands, arms and torso. And there are some gram negatives in association with um, human skin as well. Um, so it's one of the myths that gram negatives are only associated with water. Uh, species of Paracoccus and Acinetobacter uh, do have an association with the moisture areas of the, under the arms and uh, between the, the toe webs. Um, there's also variation between people. And uh, it, it is a fact that men carry more microorganisms than women and do um, shed more. And there can be variations as people as people age as well. Um, now, in terms of what could be found on the skin, how much and what that relates to, um, it, it's just interesting just to touch upon two laws of, uh, of biology. Um, 
So first of all, we have Liebig's law of the minimum. And this says that growth is controlled um, not by the total resources available, but by the scarcest resources that are available. So this means that microbial numbers are always going to be a factor of the available nutrients um, present. And then there's another uh, law of biology called Shelford's law of tolerance, which is that a, a population, and in this case microorganisms, is subject to an ecological minimum, maximum and optimum for any particular environment. And here, non-nutritional factors will affect um, the numbers of microorganisms um, like pH, humidity, and temperature. And then we've got the third factor of the natural mechanical shedding. Um, and just to recap something I said earlier, so m most of these microorganisms are carried on these rafts of skin matter, the skin flake, and these tend to conform to a size of um, 33 by 44 by 4 microns, which is another reason um, when we've spoken about particle counting in the past that um, the additional assessment of the greater than 5 micron particles can be quite useful because these actual bits of skin uh, flakes that, that, that present a risk of being microbial carrying are going to be these larger um, particles. And uh, I mentioned earlier the, the work by Bill White, which has assessed the numbers of these that uh, of these skin cells that are likely to be carrying microorganisms. And this kind of showed that the kind of average um, numbers of, of organisms you might find is around is around four. Um, so what can we learn from all of this? Well, putting these um, different risk factors together. Um, it means that if we want to get good contamination control, we need to um, have oversight. And it's important that the microbiologist is, is as involved as the production manager or the purchasing department in specifying things like clean room undergarments and deciding whether these are providing an effective barrier, particularly for the more moist parts of the of the body. Sorry to introduce um, a less savoury subject, but it, but it is an important one. Uh, the importance of the outer gown in covering all parts of the body, including the forehead, because we know we have this particular anaerobic risk. The quality of clean room certified garments and how they have been certified, what the audit process is, what the sterilisation process is. The level of training required in relation to gowning and the way that gown qualifications are conducted. Having a maximum time that clean room suits can be worn for, and this becomes especially important in aseptic areas. And this is because the filtration efficiency of the gown reduces the more that people sweat. Um, ensuring that changing rooms have the highest air change rates and have higher air change rates than um, perhaps conventional clean rooms because of the act of gowning is going to create so many particulates and then where we're using recycled gowns is to have an understanding about how many times can a gown be recycled and re-laundered and re-sterilized um, before the integrity and the ability of the filtration system of that gown is adversely affected. Okay let's have a quick look at environmental um, monitoring because we've spoken a lot about control factors, but we do need to ensure um, and, and to try and detect any people related contamination. And the main verification tool, however flawed it is, remains environmental um, monitoring. So we have to have a degree of air sampling because air can move contamination around as a vector and things will settle out onto surfaces. So we need to have a degree of um, surface monitoring. And we also need to ensure that people are keeping surfaces appropriately cleaned and disinfected. And we can subject people to procedural controls, but we need to assess these in particular. Um, so really, I want to focus on sort of three areas of uh, environmental monitoring in relation to people. And these are the gown qualification, the exit suit plates and the um, 
finger plates. So an important principle with gowns and going into aseptic areas, because that uh, really is the kind of Annex 1 theme, is that um, only personnel who are qualified and appropriately gowned should be permitted access into aseptic areas. And those gowns must be uh, sterile, assessed as non-shedding, uh, covering all skin and hair, so that's face mask, hoods, if there's a need to put on a pre uh, beard or moustache cover, protective goggles, elastic gloves, and so on. To have good written procedures, and ideally with photographs, showing uh, the ability to gown in, in, in an appropriate manner. To make sure that the gown is a full barrier, and that that is by overlapping principles, so that gloves overlap sleeves for so on. And if any gown becomes torn or wet, that it is changed um, immediately. And with those procedures in place, it's important that gown qualifications are conducted. Um, so this would be a combination. So sometimes people say, what makes a good gown qualification? Well, it's going to be um, a degree of visual observation. So when the gown's unwrapped, does the operator prevent the, the legs of the gown hitting the floor? Are they able to get changed without connecting to surfaces? And then um, some monitoring while the gowning is taking place. So this might be looking for uh, air deposition, for example. And then some facilities uh, may do an additional check to see if the person is shedding or not. So this might be going into a room and walking around an air sample, air, air sampler, for example. And then at the end is the exit suit gown plates. Um, now, in terms of how often that should happen, um, the current um, Annex 1 does not state how often, and the FDA uh, aseptic guidance talks about annual qualifications, although with a caveat that more frequent assessments may be required if there are concerns. Personally, I think that a, a six monthly um, qualification is, is a good thing to, to do and that just keeps a, a general check on how well operators are performing. Now, exit suit plates um, are an important assessment um, when people leave the area. They can't be taken while people are doing their jobs because the contact plate um, Agar affects the integrity of the gown, and it's also not um, can't they can't disinfect it afterwards. So this is on the uh, the point of immediately leaving the clean room area, and it's important to consider how many locations will be taken, uh, to have a rationale for the selection of those locations, and to have assessed how long the contact plate should make contact with the gown for, and whether any particular applicator is required to control pressure or whether it's done on an individual basis. And the um, degree of self-sampling that ever might be permitted versus the requirement to have somebody else take the samples. And if it's somebody else taking the samples, whether that is a member of that production team or whether it's an independent uh, quality control um, function. And suit contact plates can yield interesting information. Um, so results might reflect recent activities. So if we're taking a, uh, uh, a leg sample and then someone's been leaning on the floor and there's counts recorded, that shows a weakness with that activity. Um, if somebody has done an intervention, then recovery from arms is, is really important. Um, it's often that the top of the head yields the highest um, counts. And um, it might be interesting if we find the same microorganism across different parts of the um, body. So there is some interesting data that can be uh, extracted from that um, process. Now, as it stands in um, that, we also need to look at um, gowns in relation to fingers. And we're able to take gloved finger plates with more regularity. Um, so we would take those um, 
a number of times a shift and that would need to be um, factored in and following every key activity and certainly each intervention and manipulation. Um, and it's important we've got a defined technique to avoid contamination. It can often be more effective if someone else is holding the plate in order to get uh, leverage and to make sure that um, there is adequate pressure and time applied. And this might be something which the microbiology laboratory processing the plates would need to assess whether they can see the finger dab marks, for example. Um, so it is important that um, the plates are taken in relation to key activities. And once the plate has been taken, that the gloved hand is disinfected immediately after. And it's incredibly important that hands are not disinfected before, because that will just um, create false data and not give an idea of the risks presented to the um, facility. And it's important that the um, agar used contains a disinfectant neutralizer, because there may be residues of the glove disinfectant. Um, remaining. Um, it's also important that we also may take, uh, if we're using gauntlets as well, uh, so connected to a RABS system is also important to take. Now in terms of levels, we have regulatory guidance for finger plates, um, one CFU for grade A and five CFU for grade B, and that's based on EU GMP. For gowns, it tends to be um, similar to the finger plate that is adopted in the absence of any clear guidance. Some facilities would go for five CFU per location, and some would go for a summation of all the different gown plates not to exceed five CFU. Um, that's an interesting point of debate, but in practice, most gown plates should not pick up anything, and where they do, they're picking up the occasional one. So. Um, it still should be something that, that isn't very high in terms of the monitoring. It's very important to trend the uh, people related data. So what locations in relation to the people, where were they working, dates, times, identification results, looking for things like shift changes, uh, particularly for facilities gone from gone to a 24 seven way of working because people may be more tired and there may be different um, factors from that, whether there's any seasonality and also in relation to any HVAC operational problems. So if the temperature goes up and people become hotter, they might be perspiring more and that might lead to a spike in human related um, monitoring. And then characterizing the microorganisms is also really important um, because um, this also offers clues as to whether we're recovering things that are naturally part of the of the human skin microbiome or whether there's something strange, something transitory um, going on. And these things can can happen more often in normally in lower grade clean rooms. But um, I, I know of a case who, who's someone who used to have a horse and they go and visit that horse before they came to work. And then there were some strange microorganisms recovered from the clean room environment. Um, with the control of the culture media, it's important that the culture media is picking up and detecting um, what we expect. So the growth promotion of the organisms included in the growth promotion is really important. And the, the incubation times and temperatures are reflective of what we're trying to recover. Um, so we need to uh, make sure that our growth promotion is robust. So it's not just simply following what the pharmacopoeia sterility test might require and putting that in place for environmental monitoring culture media. We need to have things, as I mentioned earlier, potentially like streptococci in that testing um, regime. Okay, so sorry I've gone over a little bit, um, but drawing things to a close, we've looked at uh, clean rooms, contamination risks, a little bit about the human microbiome and the ecology of skin, uh, why we need to protect clean rooms by barriers and gowns, a little bit about monitoring, a little bit about limit setting and the importance of understanding microorganisms. So thank you very much. 
thanks, Tim. That was quite a comprehensive overlook view of um, contamination risks in the clean room. We've had a few questions come in. Um, we've probably got time for a couple of them. Uh, the first one is from Nina, and she said, what is your opinion about showering before entering the clean room? Um, that's an interesting one. I think um, obviously everyone has responsibility for um, personal hygiene. Um, I think it very much depends on the individual and in relation to um, in, in, into the data. Um, I don't think it's necessarily anything that needs to be done at work, but um, for some people it's preferable before, some people it's preferable after, some it doesn't make any difference. And it really relates to the to the natural balance of the skin, whether it's particularly dry or or not. The drier the skin, studies have shown the uh, higher number of particles that are generated. Okay, so we've got a question from Kelly. He says currently we are changing outer grade B gloves after finger dabs because of concern of potential risk of plate media cross contamination. And he just wondered, is this standard? Um, I don't know if it's necessarily standard. Um, the studies that I've looked at um, for agar residue, if, if you're applying 70% IPA after the finger dab and you have a qualified method for doing that and, and there's a european standard for glove sanitization qualification which i think is en 1500 um, but it looks at the technique and you know there's that when there's like those kind of posters before you go into hospital about um rubbing the hands and uh and doing the fingers and this sort of thing and around like a 30 to 60 second technique should remove the agar residues but equally if um, you, you have concerns and there's nothing wrong with changing gloves the only thing is is that if you're working in an aseptic area you shouldn't really be leaving the aseptic area because the act of going in and out can also reduce additional risks so um, there's no right or wrong it's about um, adequate risk assessment Okay, um, we have a couple more by the look of it. I've got a, a question from Tony who says, how often should operators disinfect their gloves? Um, so again, I'd say for aseptic areas, if someone's standing there not doing anything, then um, maybe once every 15 minutes might be might be appropriate. The other times then are before and after every every activity. Um, it, it, it's very easy to have low levels of contamination, and the and the glove is a very um, easy transfer route. So for the sake of a 30 second blast with 70% IPA and a quick rub of hands, it's a small uh, it's a small price to pay for the protection that's delivered. In terms of the in terms of the product. Okay, thank you, Tim. Well, that's all we've got time for today, unfortunately. Um, any questions we didn't get round to? As I mentioned at the beginning, we will put them to Tim, and I will forward on his answers along with a copy of the slides from today and a link to a recording of the webinar. Um, remember that we don't have a um, webinar next month in August because we're, we're assuming we're all going to be going off on holiday hopefully but our next webinar will be on the 29th of September and it will be spores in my clean room remediation and disinfectants as I mentioned at the beginning as well if you're interested in Tim's um, training on developing a contamination control strategy please do get in contact with me on behalf of the RSSL sterile manufacturing team, I'd like to again thank Tim for continuing to deliver such informative webinars for us and thank you to all out there for listening. Please don't hesitate to contact me if you've got any questions or if you need any support with any projects. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.